In my worldview, I can make sense of both natural processes and miracles. Good for you. So how important is it for you to examine what makes sense to you to determine whether it's an illusion or not? Is there a difference between a miracle and a magic trick? I would contend that, given atheism, you can't even make sense of natural processes and these universal immaterial laws that govern our universe. I would contend that you're reading more into atheism than is actually there. Atheists are people who don't believe that gods are real. That's it. They don't have to understand or have an opinion about cosmology, philosophy, biology or even the supernatural. If it doesn't directly relate to the God question, it's irrelevant to atheism. So when I offer my opinion on the origin of life and the universe, I'm doing it as a person, not an atheist. Now we get to the proselytizing part. Jesus is unique in human history in that he's the only one who actually addressed the problem of sin. This assumes that biblical sin is real and is problematic in the real world. I'm all for people behaving altruistically, but the Bible describes sin as anything Yahweh doesn't approve of, such as having a foreskin when you're more than eight days old, or eating pigs rather than locusts, or loving your wife more than a character in a book. While every religion tries to tell you what to do to try and get to God, Jesus actually hits us with the facts. We've all come short of God's perfect and holy standard. If God is perfect, why didn't he design us without foreskins? Why make things more complicated and painful than they needed to be? Doesn't sound much like a perfect plan to me. The answer isn't to try harder, because as hard as we try, we'll always fall short. That's why Jesus paid our fine, took our punishment on himself, so that we don't have to. This makes no sense to me. If I've done something wrong, punish me. That way, I'll be less likely to commit the same crime again in the future. We can't earn it. It's a gift. Forgiveness is offered to anyone who wants it. This just throws up a whole bunch more questions. Forgiveness for what exactly? Have we actually offended a real deity? If he is real and got pissed off with us for working on the Sabbath, no matter how short of cash we were, why does he require the shedding of blood to forgive us? I don't understand the mechanism. Why not just forgive us and move on without the bloodshed? If someone I cared about, as God is supposed to care about all of us, did something to piss me off, and the only way to appease me was for someone else to shoot a rabbit, you'd accuse me of losing my mind. Christians tell us that God and Jesus are the epitome of love and forgiveness. Well, what about the poor rabbit? Why is the bloodshed necessary? If that's what you call a gift, then thanks but no thanks, you can keep it. Now we get to the part where I asked about proof for miracles in modern times. You said you wanted some kind of miracle on video camera or something like that. Well for starters, the problem isn't that you don't have enough evidence. I know that might sound like a bold claim, but I know it because it's revealed in scripture. Oh well, in that case it must be true. How silly of me to think that the scriptures contained in the Bible might have been altered or embellished in some ways over history by selfish men. I don't know what came over me. When Jesus performed miraculous acts, people either worshipped him or they hated him. And if they hated him, it didn't matter what kind or how many miracles he performed. They wouldn't worship him. I know people thought differently back then, but it seems odd to me that the only options are to worship or hate. Where does indifference come into the equation? As for the miracles, is it not more plausible to conclude that they were added to the stories as time went by? If we look at the order in which the New Testament was written, rather than how it appears in our Bibles, we see that the Pauline epistles made little or nothing of miracles. Then Mark, or whoever wrote that book, barely mentioned them either. Then through Matthew, Luke and John, the miracles got more elaborate. The Gospel of Peter was rejected from the canon, presumably because even the compilers of the Bible thought that a walking, talking cross was too far-fetched. There are a whole lot of things that you do, and that I do, that God absolutely hates. You're assuming he's real, of course. 
He wants you to change your ways and to give Him control over your life and to become His servant. What? You mean, like a slave? Most people aren't willing to do that. We all naturally want to be our own gods. Excuse me? I hear this a lot from believers. Wanting to be a god is an alien concept to an atheist. Remember, we're the guys who don't believe that there are such things as gods. You seem to be projecting your way of thinking onto others. And we spend our life trying to chase what we desire, trying to find fulfillment in false gods, be they money or cars or women or YouTube fame or whatever it is. But none of these can ultimately satisfy because they're all false gods. So anything we enjoy doing, whether it's scuba diving or smoking a pipe, is a false god. I don't see it that way. So what about the real God? And if you want a glimpse into God's eternal nature, you can take a look at biblical prophecies surrounding the life of Jesus. When he was born, where he was born, specific events in his life, how he would die, all foretold hundreds of years before he was born. We still have manuscripts today that date back from before Jesus' birth. I don't think that biblical prophecies are all they're cracked up to be. You see, I've read the Bible, and I've been able to do what no ordinary member of the public could do in the millennium or so between the time the stories were written down and the invention of the printing press. It's easy nowadays to take notes and compare Bible stories. And what do we find? Thousands of discrepancies. There is also the fact that the people who wrote the New Testament would have known about the Old Testament, even if they didn't have a copy to refer to, which would explain why the apparent prediction of the birth of Jesus in Isaiah actually describes the pregnancy of a virgin, otherwise translated as a young woman, several hundred years before the time of Jesus. The author of Matthew retrofitted his story so that it matched what he turned into a prediction of the future. Thomas Paine addressed many of these so-called prophecies over 200 years ago in his excellent Age of Reason. I encourage anyone who is unfamiliar with and interested in his work to check out the link in the description. You don't need a video camera to understand Bible prophecies about Jesus. We have history. That's true, so long as you define history as being contained in the Bible itself. Despite what many Christians claim, there is no extra-biblical reference to Jesus from the time that he was said to have lived. All we know about him comes from the Bible. It always amazes me how people can laugh at the idea of water turning into wine, yet they themselves believe that the entire universe exploded into existence from nothing. We understand a fair bit about fermentation and cosmology, but magically turning water into wine at a party because someone forgot to bring enough is a step too far for me. If God can do the latter, then you don't need to worry about turning water into wine. It's simply not a problem. You're entirely missing the point at this point in your video that we're not arguing for or accepting the proposition that a god caused the Big Bang. Obviously. Anyway, thank you for watching and see you in the next video.